Okay, uh, now that we've discussed what the term evidence-based policing means, we're now going to move to the second learning objective, which is reviewing the actual evidence for evidence-based policing. So what do we know from decades of policing research about tactics and strategies that can reduce crime? At the time this presentation was developed in 2012, there were approximately 120 studies evaluating police tactics with regards to their effectiveness in reducing crime. Some show tactics that work, others show tactics that don't work or that backfire on the police. And there are even more studies out there with regards to officer stress, shift work, beha officer behavior, and other aspects of policing. Now, we're not going to have time to go over every study uh, that's out there today. So instead, I'm going to focus on some generalizations from the crime control research in policing specifically. These generalizations come from something called the evidence-based policing matrix, which organizes all of the information into a single tool for officers to use. Now in your study guide, I'll have links to the matrix, and I'm also going to show you the matrix right now, just briefly so you can see what I'm talking about. So for research that's related to other aspects of policing, I also will provide some uh, information where you can obtain uh, this research as well. So with regard to the research on police crime control efforts, this information has been compiled in an easy to use and freely available online tool called the Evidence-Based Policing Matrix. Now again, I, I won't go through the creation of the matrix in this module. There's many components to the development of the matrix, but instead I'm just going to summarize quickly what we learned from the matrix about generalizations about what works in policing. For those of you who would like to explore and learn more about the matrix, here's the website listed on this slide, or you can use your smartphone to link to the QR code on the left-hand corner of this slide. We created the matrix so that all evaluations of police interventions that reached a certain threshold of scientific rigor could be housed, organized, summarized, and easily accessible to officers in the field. Each of these dots represents a field evaluation that's done with an actual police agency on a specific police intervention. Again, for those of you who'd like to learn more about this matrix and why these dots are placed where they are, please go to the website. There, you're also, you'll also find some video training modules on the matrix itself, as well as articles that you can read. Now for this introductory segment, the punchline is the most important. Not only does this tool allow officers to access and use this knowledge at any time, perhaps more importantly, it reveals general principles about the type of police tactics and strategies that work best to prevent crime. Now generalizations are important because they can be adjusted to specific settings and specificities of your agencies and jurisdictions. Okay, so what are some of these general principles? First, we know that officers can be more successful when they are proactive rather than reactive. And I'll explain what I mean by each of these in a minute. Secondly, officers can be more effective when they are more focused and tailored in their tactics and if they tailor those tactics to problems at hand. And finally, the research tells us generally that officers can be more effective if they focus on places, not just on people. So let's go through what each one of these generalizations mean. First, officers that are more effective, uh, officers that are more effective are more proactive. What does this mean? It means that an officer understands that his or her effectiveness does not rely on reactive arrest after a crime has occurred or in responding to 911 calls but rather what that officer is doing when they are not arresting or responding to 911 calls is what matters. And the problem is, as mentioned before, is that officers are trained to focus primarily on responding to 911 calls and conducting reactive arrests. But most of these activities actually take up less than half of the officer's shift. Multiple studies have found that even in really high crime cities, Officers have between 40 to 80 percent of what's called downtime or non-committal time, which is not spent doing calls for service or making arrests. 
How an officer proactively uses this time in between calls is what actually creates the crime control and prevention effect. So what does proactivity mean in this uh, time period? Being proactive means anticipating crime, disorder, and other problems before they happen and acting as a guardian to keep these problems from happening. Crime, disorder, and other problems, as well as human behavior more generally, are predictable events which pattern in space and time. Crime analysis units and agencies specialize in understanding these crime problems and patterns. Being proactive means taking advantage of this knowledge and applying the right interventions to places and times where crime clusters. Secondly, being proactive means addressing the underlying causes of a pattern of crimes, not just responding reactively to a single crime. So for example, fights can break out on Friday nights around clubs and bars. A reactive approach would be to respond to the fight call and either take a report or lock up the people who are fighting. A more proactive approach might be to anticipate that during bar closing times, and especially at certain bars, officer presence may prevent fights from occurring in the first place. You might have already learned about community-oriented or problem-oriented policing, or something called predictive policing or intelligence-led policing in some of your studies. All of these can have proactive components to them. Now granted, not all proactive approaches are effective. DARE, for example, drug abuse resistance education, is a very proactive approach to future drug use, but we also know that this proactive approach is not effective in reducing drug use. So proactivity isn't always effective, but in general, proactive approaches perform much better than reactive ones. The second principle, officers can be more effective when they focus and tailor their proactive activities to the specific problem at hand. Now, what does this mean? Let's go back to our bar fighting example. Officers could be proactive by providing more patrol during closing hours around bars. But an even more focused approach is not only prioritizing which bars cause the most problems, but perhaps understanding what is causing the problem at a particular bar in the first place. For example, the real problem could be that the club has overbooked its patronage or is a lack of security. It could be that bars are not adhering to liquor serving regulations or are over serving alcohol. It could be that when the bar closes, people congregate in a parking lot behind the bar that is not easily visible from the street where patrol officers may be located. Or it could be that parking is so tight in the parking lot that people become angry when small fender benders occur, which lead to arguments and fights. All of these point to deeper causes of the 911 crime incident calls uh, to that bar that might not be solved from simply taking a report or arresting people today. Developing a tailored strategy based on the specific problem at hand might reduce calls and arrests in the future. Again, not all focused and tailored strategies work, just as not all proactive strategies work. Sometimes a highly tailored strategy that seems like it would work ends up backfiring on the police. But generally, like with proactivity, officers who home in on approaches that address underlying and specific programs fare much better in their crime fighting efforts. And finally, the third general principle. Police can be very effective when they take a place-based approach to crime, not just a persons-based response. However, almost all policing historically and in standard operating procedures manuals focuses on how to conduct persons-based policing, not place-based policing. What this means is that you learn about how to respond to victims who call 911 or you focus on the arrest of the offender rather than fixing problems at places. Again, while responding to calls for service and learning how to properly interview, detain, arrest, and process offenders and evidence are absolutely essential in policing, we also know that many of these approaches have very little impact on crime rates or clearance rates in an officer's beat. However, we also know from quite a bit of research that officers who actively patrol crime hotspots or places where crime clusters have a greater effect than officers who randomly patrol their beat. 
We also know that half of a jurisdiction's crime usually occurs in less than 5%, and in some jurisdictions it's even less than 1% of an entire jurisdiction, driving the point home that focusing on crime hotspots is an essential tool for officers to fight crime. This also means that you need to know where the hotspots are. Don't just rely on your own knowledge of the area. Often officers believe they know where the hotspots are, but computerized crime maps from crime analysis can help you see all of them in your area. Also, it's important to know that some hotspots are much smaller than neighborhoods or communities. For example, hotspots are often intersections, street blocks, a specific address, a park, an alleyway, or an apartment complex. And each place may provide you with different clues about how to be proactive and focused at these places. For example, alleyways present opportunities for drug dealing, prostitution, and street gambling because they are hidden from the view of residents and police. These crimes can lead to other problems like robberies, shootings, rapes, and fights. Intersections may be where people come together to congregate or where fights, drug dealing, or car accidents even can occur. Universities have their own problem places as well. Students are more likely to leave laptops and phones unattended in libraries, which will be stolen. And there are certain areas of urban universities that are exposed to high crime places and are more vulnerable to crime than other places within the same university. Other places may present different types of offending opportunities. Hospitals, for example, are places where prescription drugs are stolen. Airports are places where drunken disorderly behavior and theft occur. Certain stores in large malls may be more prone than other stores to theft because of where they are located in the mall. Uh, it could be in a corner or near an exitway. Thus, officers who are more attuned to policing places and not just people are more likely to have a positive effect on reducing crime and also reducing their calls for service in the long run. Policing places is also more proactive and more focused than reactive individual-based policing. So that concludes learning objective number two. Next, we're going to discuss some ideas on converting some of these general principles of crime prevention into actual patrol tactics. Thank you.